Hi, welcome to Chapter 5, Internal Scanning and Organizational Analysis. So what is organizational analysis? Well, quite simply, it's identifying um, and developing organizational resources and competencies. So what does that mean? It means knowing your, your company's organization well. It's people, it's processes, how it does things, it's the relationships it's built up over time to other people, other companies, to its customers, its suppliers. It's how the organization basically functions and operates. What are their, their protocols? It's just knowing thyself as a company and then utilizing um, that information to make the company as, most, as successful as possible. So if there's areas where your company does well in, that's what competencies are, you focus on those, you strengthen, you strengthen those. If there's weaknesses in your company's organization, you try to um, correct those, improve them, things of that nature. Okay, so core competencies and distinctive competencies. So when we talk about core and distinctive competencies, anytime we say competencies, what we mean is something the company does very well. Just like if your competency was, say, stock trading, and you make a lot of money stock trading, uh, but you're not really great at cutting the lawn and maintaining the landscaping. So if your core competency, um, and maybe it's a distinctive competency where you do stock trading much better than most people. So should you take off half a day to take care of your grounds and skip your stock trading to save, save $50 to cut the grass and take care of your landscaping? No, because that's not one of your core competencies. So it's, you're better off trading stock for the afternoon and then paying somebody to mow your lawn. So that way, you know you're focusing on your core comp and distinctive competencies, what you do well to maximize your money and profits, and then your, your areas where you're not so sufficient, you're hiring and you're getting help to improve it with outside resources. Okay, so when we talk about resources, we're talking about um, the assets a company has, their factories, their copyrights, um, their employees, and to a certain extent, um, and thus the, the, the basic elements that make up a corporation. And a resource can be tangible and intangible. Tangible are assets and, and um, maybe even um, it could be gold or you know resources. And intangible could be things like copyrights, um, which are you know anything that's a, a right that the company owns to own, so an intangible like a character like a mickey mouse or a brand like coca-cola those are intangible assets something that you can't touch um, or resources now capabilities refer to the company's uh, um, ability to utilize its resources into something productive uh, so it's uh, capabilities utilizing what the company has as far as assets to be able to manage those assets and to turn them into profits. Okay, so a core competency is something that a company does very well throughout the whole company. So it's, a, it's widespread, it's something that the company um, does better than most other companies. So um, for Walmart, it could be uh, organization and distribution of uh, materials. Uh, for Coca-Cola, it could be their, their secret formula for their syrup. Uh, for Disney, it could be their Disney characters or, you know, which include the Marvel superheroes, the Star Wars characters, and the Disney cartoon characters, and the princesses. Those are core competencies. Now, a distinctive competency, this is um, something that's superior to the competition. So a lot of those, so a core competency can be a distinctive competency. So for example, when I talk about Marvel superheroes, that's a core competency for D Disney, but not a distinctive competency because um, Fox has their own, their own set of Marvel heroes that they work with, and Sony has a Spider-Man universe that they work with. So even though Disney has a core competency in the Marvel heroes that they use, mostly the Avengers, they um it's not distinctive because fox studios has the rights to the x-men universe and fantastic four and like i said sony has the rights to spider-man and all the heroes and villains in that world so it's not quite a distinctive competency that's why disney is working hard to bring those characters home and they just made a, a deal with um sony to 
uh, be able to uh, c c share Spider-Man, and they are actually quite aggressively pursuing Fox, even to the point where they're thinking of canceling the Fantastic Four comic book just to kind of put pressure on Fox to return some of the properties. And in the past, uh, Disney has been su successful in getting back the rights to uh, Dare, uh, Daredevil, Blade, Ghost Rider, and things of that nature. So they're constantly pursuing, they're trying to get build a distinctive competency out of this core competency. Okay, so to really help determine uh, if something is, evaluate a firm's competencies, there is this uh, uh, VRIO framework, which is just an acronym. And you, so the thing you want to ask yourself, number one, is there a value here? Does the customer, can a customer appreciate your competitive advantage? So does, is there a value to the customer? That's the first, the most important question. Secondly, is it rare? Do other competitors possess it? So if you're really great at making hamburgers and serving you know, great hamburgers and fries, how rare is that? Well, not so rare because we have McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, uh, Five Guys, Smash Burger, um, Shake Shack. So n could be a competency, but not a very rare competency. Um, how well, how easy is it or, or costly for competitors to imitate? So you could have a core distinctive competency, but is it how, um, <clears throat> how quickly or easily can someone copy it? <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> In some cases, not easy at all or impossible. So, for example, if you're Disney and you just paid $4 billion to buy the Star Wars universe, no one can really copy that. No one can create their own Darth Vader or Luke Skywalker. That is not, you know, no one can imitate that. So that would be a real distinctive competency. Uh, number four, organization. Um, is does the organization have an ability to utilize the core comp or core distinctive competency so sometimes you can have a core competency but if the organization isn't in place um to take advantage of it for example you may have a great product maybe you have a fantastic new soda but if your corporation can't get the distribution of that product uh then you know you're not going to be able to take advantage of that competency so these are things to think about in that framework now um, how can you gain a comp uh, competitive advantage against other competitors? Uh, so if, if you specifically talking about using your resources, well, one, you, you first have to understand what are your resources and be able to have a list of your resources in terms of their strengths. And then you want to be able to take those, your firm strengths and put them into uh, lump them together in certain specific capabilities or core competencies. So you could have um, a string of resources that together become a core competency. And then you want to assess how, how am I able to make profits from this core competency? So are any, in any of these core competencies, how are they distinctive? Can I re, do I really have, you know, ability to make this distinctive? You know, for one example, uh, if you look at Oreo cookies, had a core competency in their Oreo cookies. However, there was another um, cookie called the Hydrox, which actually was the original, and Oreo was the copier years later. So Hydrox, um, so they share the core competency of making this Oreo type of cookie. And they were able to turn it into a distinctive competency by buying the bakery that made the Hydrox and then sort of canceling that cookie. So there was really one Oreo cookie type out there and they created a core competency out of it. So, um, and that would be part of four or, you know, selecting a strategy that best exploits the firm's capabilities and competency. So if the firm is really good at um, making an Oreo cookie, the best thing to, you know, the best strategy would be let's buy the competition and then I think it was Sunshine Bakery was a competition and then we'll just quietly put an end to their product and we'll be the dominant, you know, Oreo product. The, um, and you also, five, you want to identify any resource gaps to invest in upgrade. So if there's, say, you're a car manufacturer, but you realize that your, your factory and equipment is old and it's causing you to have 
make cost you more money to make a vehicle, making you un, a little bit uncompetitive, then you know you have to uh, invest in upgrading your 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 factories. Okay. So let's talk about access to distinctive uh, capabilities. Now, now if we talk about an asset endowment, that is an asset or key patent that's coming from the foundation or the um, beginnings of the company. Um, so these are, you know, basically what the company was started on. And it could be for certain companies, for Coca-Cola, it could be their, their syrup formula. For Xerox, it could be the copier. For Kodak, it could be the, the, um, the film processing and chemicals. Um, now, acquired from someone else. Now, um, Disney's uh, a good example. We've been talking about Disney. And it's not just that they, they did this a few times. They, they acquired Lucasfilms. They acquired Marvel Studios. And they also acquired the first big um, billion-dollar acquisition was Pixar. Because at the time Disney had a, was struggling to make animated movies, they were the leader in this, and they fell behind. And Pixar had, you know, the top movies. So in order to remain competitive, they just bought Pixar so they could have maintain their their distinctive competency on children's animated features. Okay, um, sharing with another business, um, and this is you know <clears throat> finding a partner. You know, take to take advantage of you know two companies, two companies working together, sort of an alliance, and that could be an example of Disney working with with Sony on sharing the Marvel uh, character Spider Man because they figured that Spider Man would be stronger if you included them in the Marvel universe. So that way, when so um, Sony makes a film on Spider Man, it could bring a lot of crossover fans from the uh, Avengers uh, based movies which include the Avengers, Guardians of the Galaxy, Thor, Captain America, um, this nature. All right. So sometimes companies get together and you might see this with uh, different products where there's a successful brand and another company will leverage it and bring it, you know, bring it into their, um, you know, maybe utilize their distribution so you could have uh, a retailer or a fast food franchise team up with a known brand to to, to um, do a co venture, All right? And you could build and accumulate within the company. So you could over time, um, you could extend your expertise in certain areas and build out from there. So if you're and a good example is Honda, which started with you know making excellent small motors and it graduated that into lawnmowers and then into uh, motorcycles and to boat engines and to generators and then finally you know into cars so it's just really their core their distinctive competency was building really excellent motors and they just sort of evolved that up into many different products okay. now let's talk about access to distinctive uh, competencies uh, a cluster can be a geographic concentration of interconnected companies and industries so if you look at Silicon Valley, that's a good example of a cluster of electronics types of companies. In New York City, we have a cluster of financial companies. Uh, in Colorado, there's a cluster of clean energy types of companies. So why do these, you know, why does this happen? Sometimes it just builds up a culture of successful people, entrepreneurs that build these fast growing firms that tend to be you know, close to each other and they share employees or uh, there's a lot of talent in the area that helps to facilitate the growth of these capabilities um, within within a network of resources that all these companies shares. And, and in the middle, it could be a, um, a university that's connecting them or it could be other types of resources or tools or some sort of organization, but they sort of cluster together in a local area. And it, these clusters gives the new startups or existing companies access to really talented and experienced employees, maybe a network of close by suppliers um, and complementary products. It's just, um, you know, builds. And here on Long Island, there's sort of a cluster of vitamin companies. And there's like uh, four or five vitamin companies on the island that um, form a cl cluster of talented know how, research, development, and sales distribution of supplements but uh, okay uh, determine the sustainability of a competitive advantage and the, the one thing you want to look at is durability and 
you know, this is the rate at which a firm's um, either resource or capability or core competency can depreciate in value or become obsolete. And the biggest threat here is any type of new technology can, can make a core competency obsolete or, or irrelevant. So especially technology can be very, very destructive, especially the distribution of um, songs, TV shows, movies on the internet uh, can be really um, end a um, certain industry. So in the beginning, the CD record industry was destroyed by MP3s and the sharing of songs on the internet. However, TV uh, and movie studios learned from this and they quickly established things like Hulu and other venues uh, with uh, iTunes and different things. Uh, iTunes came along and saved the record industry, but the movie industry and the TV show industry realized that they better have some strategies for dis distributing their TV online and also with Netflix. So they were able to make um, products that met consumers' demands so that the average consumer wouldn't seek to illegally download movies and, and TV shows because the access to them is quite um, affordable and the timing in some cases is, is really not that much of a delay from the theater. So that was one way they saw that let's, let's, let's protect the durability of our movie and TV show franchise learning on the mistakes of the music industry. Okay. Uh, but yeah, a lot of times you may have industries that lasted for hundreds of years and then something changes, a new competitor moves into the market space or a mistake is, make it, uh, is made and they lose, their, they lose their core competency. And that's something that every company needs to really judge. How strong is this and how long can we hold on to it? Okay. We can also talk about... Um, Is it how easy is it for someone to copy or imitate your your core competency? Um, can it be duplicated? And if it is, if it can be duplicated, you know what are the legal protections? And you know how hard is it to duplicate? And there are, there are many things that can make you know certain core competencies more protected. Uh, one thing is. Uh, transparency, the speed with which other firms can understand the relationship and resources uh, and capability supporting the, uh, another company's successful strategy. So, you know, you could look at Gillette, which supported its dominance in the marketplace with razors and with excellent R&D. And the competitors could never really understand how the fusion razors were produced simply by taking one apart. So Gillette's razor development was very difficult to copy because it takes a lot of expensive equipment and a highly to make these razor blades so sharp and so fine um, it's very difficult turns out it's very difficult to copy um, because of the complication the size and the expense of the equipment so that's really held to um, Gillette's uh, durability of that com core competency also transferability how easy is it for competitors to uh, get the same resources and capabilities to challenge uh, your core competency? Um, you know, so in some cases, some things are not transferable because they're protected by law, like copyrights um, and patents and things like that. And in some cases, you know, if you look at the um, if you look at the Hoover vacuum with the Cyclone technology, that's pretty well uh, patented and pretty well protected, but yet we're seeing a lot of competitors making a similar type of product, maybe not exactly the same, but they figured out a way to, to copy it and do it in a way that doesn't infringe on Dyson's patents. Um, now, other things could be if things are tied to a particular region or a particular uh, resource that isn't really other 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 companies can't get their holds on their hands on it's not transferable this um, the sustainability of their advantage and the other thing is um, how easy it is to replicate um, so the ability of competitors to duplicate the resources and capabilities to imitate another firm's success so this would really be um, Companies trying to imitate, look at what another company does successfully and imitate it somehow. Uh, so it could be, 
you know, you look at a very popular product and say, okay, you know, uh, Colgate has the number one toothpaste. What can we do to become the number one toothpaste? And the reason Colgate is the number one toothpaste is it's superior advertising, product placement, and distribution and sales channels. It's it's something that can be replicated, but it is difficult to replicate uh, to compete at a company that has hundreds of years of working this model and perfecting it. Okay. Uh, we could also talk about explicit knowledge. <clears throat> So how easy is it to document and communicate um, this core competency? Is it something that uh, can easily be put into words or into documents to explain how to do it? Or is it something that's much more difficult to really explain? It's, 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 it's sort of almost a mystery. Um, and is it the tactic knowledge, which is knowledge that's not easily communicated uh, because it's deeply rooted in the corporation and employee experience and culture. And it's, it, um, it's more valuable and more likely to lead to sustainable competitive advantage if companies have this tactic knowledge. Um, and it's a way that management can't clearly explain the competency. Uh, it, so it's sort of it's within the corporation, but no one's not exactly sure how it got there and how it stays there. But it's, the company's been able to be successful and grow, um, even though they're not able to clearly communicate what this core competency is. Um, so that one's a little, a little hard to explain, but it's basically, you know, sometimes some companies are just, you know, good at certain things that other companies it seems like it should be easy to duplicate but it isn't you know um okay let's just move on from there let's talk about the business model um so business model we all know what this is it's it's a some sort of method or plan for making money uh in a company's business environment and it's going to include, you know, everything you, a company needs to think about and put together to make a firm successful. Hopefully, should be in its business plan to gen, that's going to detail how it's going to generate uh, revenues and make profits. Now, a business model can be a core competency. So, certain companies have better business models. For example, when McDonald's first developed uh, their franchise model, that was a better business model than, say. Uh, building and owning your own fast food restaurants. So if you're, you know, a company that doesn't want to take outside financing in the form of franchisers, you can't expand or grow as fast as a company that can get access to all these individual investors who want to open up a franchise of your business. So companies, so that's a business model that was very successful, although it was a core competency. It wasn't a distinctive competency because other fast food restaurants were able to copy it as well. So a business model usually has five elements. Who it serves, who it provides, how it makes money, how to, how to dif um, differentiate um, and sustain competitive advantages, and how, uh, how it provides its products and services. So that is basically, all this should be answered within a business plan. Um, so there are different models that could be used. There could be the customer solutions model which is why okay customer solutions model which is sort of um your company is going to provide expertise in helping other companies do business so it could be someone that it's you're providing more of a service um to help a company or even consumers to do something so it's not a physical product it's more of a, a solution that you're selling and you're selling your know-how and your, your people's ability to solve these problems. There could be sort of a pyramid model um, where you're looking to cover all the bases. So you wanna, you wanna, what, you wanna go in and find, cover all the niches um, to keep your customers in one family of products. So you may start with a low-end entry point product uh, maybe it's a company that makes watches and they have sort of an entry point product which is an inexpensive watch and then as you you know grow with the company they have other brand names that are more and more expensive and they can move you up the pyramid and they make more profits with you as you move along you know it could even be um, 
brands like a washing machine. You can start in with the low end brand of the washing machine as you become more successful, make more money, and you want to replace the washing machine, you move into a more expensive washing machine. Okay, a uh, multi-component uh, system slash install model, and this is where you basically, it could, you could think of it sort of like the printer, where you, the, the printer itself is actually cheap, maybe 30 to $50, but the ink cartridges are 20 to $30 to replace. So they basically put in a, the first component, which is relatively inexpensive, and then you buy follow-up components uh, um, that you could do this also with the, say, Xbox or PlayStation, where you buy the Xbox and PlayStation, but then the, and the companies don't make a lot of money on the actual hardware. They start making money when you start buying the software or the downloads for those video game manufacturers. There's also the advertising model um, where basically that you offer a base product for free and then you make money in advertising. So it could be a website like Facebook or Twitter or Google or LinkedIn and then the money you get the product. Basically you sign up the product for free but then they make money in advertising. Um, now it could be a switchboard model and this is a model that where a firm acts as inter an intermediary and connects multiple sellers and buyers together such as financial planners selling financial products it could be something like ebay or amazon.com where it links you um they're the they're the channel which you can buy a product from somebody else um there is um, the efficiency model where a company will wait, will wait until a product becomes a standard and then enter the market at a lower price point and become more of a low margin seller. So basically a product comes out, maybe it's the first Blu-ray uh, DVD player and then after a while other companies will make a more efficient model and come out and the price will be lowered. Same thing with TV sets and things like that or um, another company will come in, see the profits being made by the top end, maybe a top end Sony or, or Canon camera, and then they'll come out with a, they'll copy the technology or look at how it's made and make a more efficient product. And they'll come in at a lower price point. Um, there's a blockbuster model where the biggest example of this is like movie, movie studios where they rely on only a few key movies to really drive the sales of the, the industry. So, if it's someone like Disney, maybe you, you're relying on the Avengers 2 and then the Star Wars movie coming out to really be what they call your tentpole blockbusters that where most of your profits are going to be made. There's a profit multiplier model, and this is develop a concept that may or may not make money on its own, but through synergy and spinoffs could become very prof profitable. So it could be... Um, you know, in, in the past, they would make uh, TV shows that maybe weren't that profitable, but the, the selling of the toys, like the Transformers or G.I. Joe, would be immensely profitable. Or certain movies they would make with a, um, an instance of the toys becoming much more profitable. You know, for example, uh, in the beginning, Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back were pretty cool movies, and they were focused on more adult audiences. And then when Return of the Jedi came out, or even the new trilogy of Star Wars films um, later on, they focused a lot on making characters that could be toys or vehicles that can be toys. So the games, the, the movies felt more uh, for children and they invented the Ewoks and Jar Jar Binks and pod racing, all these things that they could sell more toys and more characters that could become big sales in the toy arena. And that's how they would multiply their profits through licensing. And that's, you know, one of the reasons, you know, a character like Superman is, is not so profitable for the movies that Superman makes or even the TV shows. It's more the, mo the merchandising. And they merchandise Superman out to so many products. It used to be even, at one point, a Superman peanut butter that was, you know, profitable. Uh, there's the entrepreneurial model, and this is where a company specializes in the products or services to niche markets, to very small uh, segments of people. So they don't make a big blockbuster for everybody. They try to make um, a smaller, more successful product to a niche group. So maybe a magazine specifically for cat lovers or uh, some kind of micro beer or just trying to... And in today's day and age, everybody wants to feel, feel special or be in some sort of club where it's, it's really niche or smaller. 
Um, there's the de facto industry standard model, which is going to look at this offers. Um, this is a company offers a product free or a very low price point in order to saturate the market price and become the industry standard. And then once people are locked in, they offer a higher margin products to the standard. So, you know, TurboTax at one time, even today, you can do TurboTax free online if you have a very simplistic tax. Say when you have one job and you make under 40000 and you're standardizing your deductions, you could do TurboTax for free online. But then as you graduate and become, you know, uh, get a bigger job and have more complicated tax and investment situations, you're going to buy the, the TurboTax package, which is much more expensive because now that they've locked you in at the base level, you move up to the more expensive package. Let's move on to value chain. So a value chain is um, a link of activities that start from the very beginnings of the product to the very end of the product's life. So a value chain can be you're starting with gathering the raw materials, which could be um, maybe a component uh, or a material that you want to you want to um, package and resell. And then there's a primary manufacturing, turning those raw materials into a product like a vitamin or a bicycle or a car. Uh, and then there's, you know, the fabrication, which is really the fine tuning of the product. And then the, dis the distribution and the distribution is moving it into um, a, a distribution channel that will be able to get the product out to retailers. And the last step is the retailers. So this is a value chain. So a companies can be can exist in any any part of this value chain or multiple parts or all parts. So there are some companies that go from gathering and making the raw material all the way to the retailer. Uh, and there's some companies that just go to just make the manufacturing of the product, some companies that solely distribute the product, and some companies that are just a retailer. So you could be, there are two segments. It could be an upstream or a downstream. So, um, so for example, an upstream it could be sort of like oil exploration, the drilling, the moving of the crude oil to the refineries. And the downstream could be refining the oil and transporting it to gasoline um, stations and distributing it to consumers. So we have these two different uh, aspects. And the center of gravity is what part of the value chain should your company focus on that's going to take advantage of your core competencies. So if you're really good at extracting oil and, and gathering oil, but not really good at refining it or selling it through gas stations, you don't have your own network of gas stations, then you want to focus on what your company can do best. Now we could look at things in far, as far as primary activities and supporting activities in the value chain. So in the value chains, the primary activities are inbound logistics, bringing the materials together. Operations of the, of the company with the operations are all the manufacturing and factories and, and, and uh, distribution. Uh, and then the outbound logistics, which is the, actually, that's actually the distribution of the products from the warehouse to the retailers. And the supporting activities along the way are procurement. And procurement are, these are the people who actually buy the raw materials uh, to bring in house. Technological development are the R&D people who are looking to research, develop, and create new products. Human resources management, which is going to hire and maintain the talent and the competitiveness of the people the company employs. And the firm's infrastructure, which is basically the buildings and um, supporting assets that the firm is built upon. So if we look at this is a graphical representation representation of a, of a corporate's value chain, and we can see that you know this is all to make a, a profit margin. So we have the primary activities down here, which is the inbound logistics, bringing bringing handling the raw materials, operations, you know making the products, outbound logistics, the warehousing and distribution, sales and marketing, uh, and then the service uh, uh, installation, repair, and parts. So if you buy a product, sometimes you need replacement parts or repairs, and that's the service part of it. So this is the primary activities, um, and then the supporting activities help the primary activities to really find the business. So the you know the firm's infrastructure, um, which are the people you can think of it the firm's infrastructure also as the independent um, 
laborers or you have your direct manufacturer and direct laborers who work on the product, but you have your indirect personnel who support management, accounting, finance, strategic planning. You have your re human resources to help recruit and develop uh, their employees, both direct and indirect abilities. Uh, the technology department and procurement. So these four areas are helping to make sure that the primary activities can uh, function. And together, this value chain is what's going to what's going to create sort of the profits of the company if it's done well. So if we're gonna if we're gonna do anal analyze a corporate value chain, there's certain uh, aspects that we have to look at. And one, we want to examine each product line's value chain. So each company may have multiple product lines and they may involve multiple uh, value chains. Uh, we also want to examine the linkages between each product's lines and their value chain. So if we have multiple value chains for multiple different products in a large company, where do they sort of meet up or where can we combine and become more efficient? Uh, and that leads into three potential synergies. So looking at these linkages, how can we create uh, synergies which are basically one plus one equals three. So how can we look at two different, er two different um, parts of value chains within the company and become uh, more valuable? So it could be the fact that you may have, you know, six different product lines all using six different warehousing and distribution models uh, and it may actually be profitable to bring all that together into one huge distribution system. So the synergies would be something um, because the warehousing costs and distribution costs will become much lower. And this is something that Amazon actually did. Okay, so the basic business structure, if we look at basic business structures, we have the simple structure. It's a better, we have simple, functional, divisional, strategic business units, and conglomerates. So... Um, so the simple structure is actually, you know, pretty easy. Uh, it's the owner, manager, and the workers. So the owner deals directly with the workers. So very small companies. But uh, a middle, a medium-sized company would be you would have your top management who are going to talk to and work with different departments: manufacturing, sales, finance, and personnel. So this is something that uh, is quite common for uh, mid-sized companies, where the top management, the vice presidents, will work with each of the main areas in the company structure which manufacturing sales finance and personnel and if it's a much bigger company you could have multiple divisions so you could have the top management and that could be broken up and they can be working with separate divisions so division a could be sort of hardware division b could be software and they'll have their own manufacturing sales finance and personnel because they need to focus on the on the business which is which the business models are significantly different so that's why they break them up into divisions because it's more efficient for uh, and they may be so big, you're gonna need a lot of people anyway. So it may be a better structure to break them up into different uh, divisions. Uh, now, let me just go back. Divisional strategic business units are where the company breaks up. Sort of when they're breaking up their product divisions, they will put it in more strategic business units. So that's sort of um, uh, taking the divisional, but actually breaking up even further into strategic business units that work on a particular strength or strategy that they want to pursue in their own business unit to make them more nimbler and more a, a better ability to adapt to similar smaller companies. And a conglomerate is just one huge company like GE that has many businesses that it manages under one roof. Okay, so let's talk about corporate culture. Corporate culture is really each company, um, just like each family, if you may know different families, your family, um, uh, your friend's family, they they have different beliefs. Maybe they believe in different religions, celebrate different holidays, have different traditions. Well, corporations are like that too. They have um, there's a they have a collection of beliefs, expectations, of values, things they've learned of a corporation, things that they've experienced together, and they transmit it from one generation of employees to another generation of employees, like a family, and they create what's called this culture. And each company's culture is quite unique. And when you when you have you're probably going to have seven to ten jobs in your life. And I know it sounds like a large number of jobs. But believe me, it happens faster than you could believe. And you'll notice that each company sort of have its own culture. And some companies, you'll survive better in their particular culture than other companies. So this, this, what does companies, a company's culture do? Well, one, it has a sense of identity or unity or like a team functionality, like you're part of a team and you have this pride or this identity that the company has for its employees. 
and it can generate employee commitment. So if you really believe in the product or the company or the culture, you're really a fan of the culture, you get along well and you feel um, well adjusted and taken care of within the corporate culture, it's going to generate a commitment for you to work for and stay and work hard for that company. Uh, but some corporate cultures can be negative and toxic where that's a big problem for companies. They lose a lot of money because employees just keep leaving because they're not treated well. Uh, three, uh, stability of the organization as a social system. So the company culture develops a recognizable and predictable pattern for employees to create sort of a, a stability. Like a lot of families have a sort of stability or they have uh, a stability that's uh, developed through a routine uh, that can be dependent upon. Um, and it's a framework of reference for employees to understand the organizational activities and a guide for behavior, what's acceptable in the organization for for example, some companies it's acceptable to bring your pit, your pets to work, your kids to work, to play games during work, and other um, to dress down and dress casual. In other companies, it's severely frowned upon. Okay, so is a thing called cultural intensity, and you want to know what is really the degree that this culture is really noticeable and pronounced uh, and associated with the company. And what's the depth in the history of this culture? Some companies have very light culture where it's almost not even noticeable or not really distinctive. And some companies, some companies have very intense cultures. And the integration of the cultures, how, how well is this culture integrated through all the different units within the organization? And you know, um, is this culture prevalent in all the different business units and all the different aspects of the, of the, com of the company? Or do different uh, divisions of the company have different cultures? Uh, even different departments and companies. Accounting department can have a different culture than the sales and marketing department. Okay, market position. When we look at a market position, um, this is something that you you know. Um, it deals with the question of uh, who are the customers, who are we selling to. So it's sort of looking at specific areas of marketing concentration that can be expressed in terms of product. Uh, market and geographical locations. So the marketing uh, research corporations are able to practice market segmentation, which is um, niches that their products can be sold to the particular groups that they can market and develop um, and hopefully not have their, their the company compete with other divisions within the company. Now, the marketing mix are things that do I have a slide on that? Yeah, I do. So the marketing mix are key variables under companies control that's going to affect the, the, you know, the sales and help them to become more competitive. You know, in the marketing mix, uh, we have uh, variables for the product, the level of quality, the, level, um, the amount of options or add-ons, the brand name, the packaging, the size, the warranties, the, the return policies. These are all things that make a product very um, valuable and more sellable. The place, where can you buy it? How um, can you buy it online? Are there stores? What's the coverage, the amount of inventory, does it sell out quickly? And then the promotion. How is it advertised? Do you do personal, person to person selling, TV, publicity? Uh, and then the price. Or do you have different products at different price levels, price points? How do you do coupons and discounts, allowances, uh, credit terms? These are all things in the marketing mix to help. And they're all different things to think about in your strategy to help sell a product. Now the product life cycle is the understanding that products go through this cycle. They start off as new and they're introduced and it takes a while for people to catch on. Just like um, DVD players did, HD TVs, uh, Blu-ray players did. It, it takes a while. In fact, you know, in the beginning there was Blu-ray Blu and HD DVD. So in the introduction phase, we weren't sure who was going to make it to the growth phase. And it turned out the Blu-ray players made it to the growth phase, and now they're in their maturity. So at a certain point, these Blu-ray players will decline. And the thing that will cause this industry of Blu-ray players to decline is the fact that most things can easily be downloaded and watched on your, your, your television box. So there's no real need for uh, physical Blu-ray DVDs anymore because everything can be downloaded, saved, and played on demand. So that would be this product. You'd have to know where your product is in its life cycle to know whether or not to ramp up or contract sales and marketing, distribution, production, demand, and things of that. Or think of a whole new business to get into if it looks like your product's going to end, such as 
before the uh, like the DVD players or the VCRs before them, when the product ends, you have to figure out a new product to get into. So if you're a DV, if you're a Blu-ray manufacturer, maybe you want to get into the digital recorder or distribution of products of uh, digital media to kind of make up for the fact that the blue the Blu-ray player is going to be in decline soon. Now, things that help a company sell products and maintain its reputation is the brand. A brand is a very powerful thing, and it gives a company, gives consumers a name to associate the company with, and identifies the company and the the name of the company and the product in the consumer's mind. And a big example is Coca-Cola is a huge, the biggest brand, and they had their first diet soda was called Tab, and it sold okay, but they really didn't do that well. But then they came up with the idea, well, hey let's make it let's call it let's get rid of tab or really minimize it and we'll make a new diet soda called diet coke and that was a phenomenal success and that started sort of the era of um brand extension so now you have diet coke you have caffeine free coke caffeine free diet coke you have cherry coke you have vanilla coke you have um all uh all these different coca-cola because they're all brand extensions uh and in many industries if we're talking about Oreos earlier, we have these brand extensions to Oreos. You have Oreo cereal, you have Oreo, Oreo um, bars, you have different types of Oreos, spring Oreos, you have s'mores Oreos, you have reverse Oreos, you have fudge Oreos, you have um, double Oreos, double stuff, triple stuff. You know, so these are all brand extensions where you're trying to take a successful brand like Oreo or Coca-Cola and you're trying to extend it to many different names because the brand is so powerful. Now, how does a brand become powerful? Well, definitely through quality and consistency and advertising and marketing uh, can start to gain consumers' a familiarity and later loyalty. And if you look at, you know, people are, you know, people get so brainwashed by brands that people actually prefer different soda brands. Like, oh, I'm a Pepsi person or I'm a Coke person. I would never drink Pepsi. And, you know, the truth is they're not really that much difference in taste that even in a lot of taste tests, people can't tell which soda is the other, but you're so brainwashed by the brand, you can you only want to buy that brand. Um, and it turns out that the only thing that can really break people from a brand is a significant cost reduction in the price of buying the product. So you may be really, um, you know, love your brands when you go to the supermarket, but then when you become you know, when you have to feed a family and you don't really have all the money to buy all the name brands, sometimes you start buying the no frills brands or, the, or um, to make ends meet. So price is always a product. Now the corporate brand is really just the corporate name like IBM or Microsoft. So the corporate has a brand and then they make products underneath that brand. So corporate reputation is very, if you're gonna make a corporate brand that's gonna sell products under say the Microsoft label, uh, you better have a good corporate representation and reputation so people perceive the company um, in a positive way. And, you know, two attributes, <coughs> how the stakeholders view the corporation and the perception of quality and, and, the corp and how prominent the corporation is in the minds of its, its stakeholders. So it's very important for you know, the corporate repu representation, uh, reputation uh, and not just with the consumers, but also the stakeholders, which we talked about in the previous chapter, mostly employees and other people directly involved in the corporation. Now, other strategic uh, financial issues could be uh, financial leverage. So this is how much, basically how much debt the company takes on. So debt is issued to help increase. So if you have a good company, so maybe you're Shake Shack and you want to borrow some money so you can make many more locations or Chipotle Mexican Grill and you know that we're very profitable we're doing very well so it makes sense to borrow money to expand quickly but that's going to give that gives you a financial leverage we're using money to help grow the business of the company it comes at a cost because you have to pay interest on this financial money and there was an example of Boston Market where they borrowed too much money too quickly to expand At this time they're called Boston Chicken they expanded so quickly that the financial leverage was too much and they went bankrupt. It was still a great business and McDonald's eventually bought the business uh, and ran it successfully and profitably and later sold it to a capital venture group. But it wasn't that Boston market was not a successful franchise or business. It was just that they got too much financial leverage that they couldn't 
control. Just like if you went and started getting a lot of credit cards and borrowing all sorts of money on your credit cards, but then not really having the ability to pay them back, that would be the danger of that financial leverage. And there's also capital budgeting. And this is where um, financial analysts sit down and look at, okay, how much capital do we have? And by capital, well, we mean money. So how much money do we have? And what, what should we do with this money? So we need to analyze the best possible investments to put this money into. Should we buy another company, expand our existing product lines, put money in research development to develop new products? So these are all things that companies have to look at all the possible investments, see how much money they have, and then put their money in the investments. Just like if you had a certain amount of money in your retirement account, you want to look at all different stocks and mutual funds and figure out what's the best investments to put your money in. And the hurdle rate is basically you want to make more money than the cost of that money. So money, all capital has a cost, and you want to make sure that the capital budget is going to be investing in, in investments where the return is going to be higher than the cost of the money. And again, this is a topic that is I specifically talk about to great detail in um, our finance 330, BUS 330 class. Uh, R&D intensity, how much spending is a company going to do into R&D as a percentage of sales? So a lot of companies will link, you know, 5% of sales are going to be tied to research development. So if you're a company that's really closely tied to technology or development of new products, like a technology company like Apple or, or, or a pharmaceutical company, you have to spend a lot of money in research development. So you want to gain market share by uh, maintaining your competitiveness in the innovation of, uh, of your technology. And technology transfer is a process of taking new technologies from your laboratory research development area and figuring out how to sell it in the marketplace. There's been plenty of new technologies that have been developed. The most famous um, example is Xerox actually developed uh, the GUI, a graphical interface for computers, and things like the mouse. Uh, they didn't know how to move that from the laboratory, their laboratory, to the marketplace. And then along came a guy, um, Steve Jobs, that recognized the, the, uh, how to do that and actually did move those products to the marketplace and became very successful. So uh, the R&D mix, if we look at the R&D mix, um, uh, it should be appropriate for the strategy of the company considering the company's product life cycles. You don't want to overspend an R&D where you're not going to get a return. So you want to focus on the problems at hand, the basic problems, and make sure that you're constantly trying to improve um, and, and hopefully dominate the early cycle of a product's life uh, and extend the product life cycle by, by making the product more valuable in later stages and with more designs, and upgrades, and features to keep it relevant. And they emphasize on hopefully reducing costs or improving quality. Now the product R&D is really going to focus on the marketing and is concerned with you know product packaging improvements and product improvements uh, as far as making the product more desirable. Where the engineering R&D is going to really concentrate on the quality of the product, the, the design of the product. Hopefully, you can design a product to be um, better quality at a lower cost. So this is really key, and especially in an industry like the automotive industry where today's automotive vehicles are light years ahead of what they were in the 80s as far as computerization, safety features, luxury features, miles per gallon. Um, these are all been able to be done due to engineering and product R&D that aggressively allowed com automotive companies to make better cars and not significantly increase the price of the car above inflation to do it. And that has to be all R&D that really helped propel them to that level. Now, if you look at a, a technology dis, uh, discontinuity, and this is when new technology can not, cannot be used to enhance current technology, uh, but substitutes for the technology that make a better performance. So in this case, um, something comes out, a new type of technology that just completely replaces the previous technology due to better yields or better uh, performance. And this is something that can be very disruptive. If you aren't the company coming up with a new technology or being able to, you know, Kodak did come up with digital uh, photographs, but they didn't want to uh, utilize it because they were worried about their film business. But it eventually, their lack of um, continuity in this area put the company, made the company's life really miserable. Uh, and it's the same thing even with the Dyson, we're talking about the Dyson vacuum cleaners earlier, they have this cyclone technology that they were offering to sell to other vacuum manufacturers. And Hoover famously said like, um, they weren't interested in it because it was going to put, put, put them 
one segment where they made a lot of money was they would sell a vacuum cleaner then sell bags for their vacuum cleaner and they didn't like the, the cyclone technology because it eliminated the bag so they didn't want to they didn't want to license it from hoover and uh from Dyson. So Dyson went out and made their own vacuum cleaners and became hugely successful. And later on, Hoover said, you know what? We really made a big strategic mistake. We should have bought that technology and buried it because now it's really completely changed the industry. So as technology changes, companies have to have a good strategy to either incorporate it or counter it. Otherwise, their products become technologically useless. Okay, strategic uh, operations issues. So these are more operational based issues. And one be, can be intermittent systems. Intermittent systems. And this is um, when we talk of this, what we're basically looking at, I'm, I'm trying to think of the best way to describe, to describe this. We can kind of think of this as um, where the process is not always um, continuous or, or, in a, or, in, or a typical sequence. Things can be sort of uh, jump back and forth you know, sort of like repair work. Uh, it's not that common. Continuous systems are more common where uh, things are lied, uh, are work in a, sequ a sequential order where products are continually assembled in the assembly line or, or processed in, in, say, making food or processed food that is a continuous where it starts and never kind of ends and you just go from beginning to end and keep making the product. And there's really no change in the variability. Now, Operating leverage is the impact on um, the sales volume and the net income. So when you get to a point in your operating life where you're covering all your fixed costs, new additional sales generate even more profits. So if you get to a point where your basic costs are covered, so any additional manufacturing comes at a very reduced price, that would show operational leverage, which is a good thing and why companies want to get their economies of scale to really take advantage of this operational leverage. And then the experience curve is basically just saying that as companies become more experienced in manufacturing and producing, they become better at doing it. And so as they increase their volumes and the experience of, of manufacturing, making a particular product or making more of that product, it becomes easier, cheaper, and more efficient. Just like if you were to practice something and do something multiple times, you get better at it as well. And that's all experience curve basically means. Okay. Uh, autonomous or self-managed would be a group of people that sort of work without a supervisor. Uh, and this is more, we're talking sort of um, in a human resources area of the, the, the company. We, we want to look at, these are some issues here. And autonomous is really being like, okay, your group has this problem, go off and solve it, we're not going to bother you. And a lot of people work better when there's not a boss looking over their shoulder. There are some ideas of um, cross-functional teams, work teams. And this is where you take people from various departments, various disciplines in the company, and you have them work together to solve a problem that's company-wide problem. Uh, concurrent engineering is a specialist working side-by-side -side with uh, design and cost, uh, to, to specifically design a cost-effective product with features that customer wants. So it's just, you know, um, a better way of engineering a product that's gonna be more focused on all the relevant products that the, cu the customer is going to be problems the customer is going to be experiencing or wanting to look at. Uh, virtual teams, and this is sort of getting a taste of that when you work online. It's just people in different geographic areas working together to, to solve a problem using telecommunications uh, software and and so Skype and different things like that and go to meeting to work virtually to solve problems um, when people aren't all in one physical headquarters. Okay, so virtual teams, um, because organizations are becoming flatter and there's more um, locations of companies around the world and, and company and employees are working more autonomously, virtual teams are becoming more of a norm. So a highly knowledge, knowledgeable people may not be in the same uh, global area, so these, these virtual teams are becoming more of a solution because in the past they used to just fly these people to one location to work on a problem and fly them back and it's very time consuming and expensive so virtual teams are a solution to that now quality of work life this is something that companies may want to have a strategy on because the happier your employees are the better quality they perceive the more likely they are to produce and stay with long long term with the company so you want to have um, the ability for employees to feel like they're participating in problem solving that they're able to restructure the work that would be better for them 
that there, there's a reward system for companies that are productive or innovative. Uh, and the work environment is shown as a constantly improving environment where they just don't rest on their laurels. They're always looking to make things better, take ideas from employees and change with the times and make a better work environment. And this is all to lead to a better uh, and happier employee that will lead to more profits. And one thing that makes a work environment even more effective is have diversity. Have many different representations of different cultures, different races, different backgrounds. It provides a competitive advantage because they're going to see issues and problems with... So if you make a product and you think you're going to sell it in another country, maybe you make a product in designing the United States and then you want to sell it in Europe and then you find that you know, Europeans aren't really, they don't really like cup holders or like the idea of eating food in their car. Or you want to sell a particular food product in India or China and there's certain different religious constrictions that they're not going to eat that product because it contains, you know, a particular uh, type of animal or, 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 or component. You know, so having people from different cultures and backgrounds, they bring up these problems say, hey, that don't name your car Nova because in Spanish that means no go. So don't make a Chevy Nova and try to sell it in Mexico because no one's, they're going to say that it's a no car go. You know, so these are things why that's important. All other issues is change in um, technology. You need to have a strategic plan for uh, information technology and systems because the information systems are what's going to help automate the company things like uh, jp power um uh i'm sorry jd edwards or oracle or peoplesoft or sap or big computer systems software systems that run the back offices of company and automate automate the tasks of individuals uh enhance key business functions because they're linking the whole company together in this one giant uh, computer program and it can make a competitive advantage. So if you're using SAP, something that I actually uh, specialized in, which was a great career because companies were so complex and companies were really paying a premium for employees who understood and could configure and program SAP, SAP would really help companies once they installed it to have a better real-time picture of all their sales and products and inventory and, and backlog and, and accounts receivable, accounts payable and purchasing and procurement and, and um, uh, demand for raw materials and manufacturing cycles. It just made all the companies' different computer systems exist in one big computer uh, program that helped really manage and bring to a real-time reporting of where the company was and just made analyzing a problem so much easier. So companies that have a better information system, a more effective and a smarter information system, are going to be able to be more competitive and more functional. Um, also, supply chain management. And this is really looking at the supply chain of a company. And this is, um, the supply chain is similar to the value chain. And it's um, it's the forming of networks and, and um, uh, sources of raw material, manufacturing products, or creating services, storing and distributing the goods and delivering them to customers. It's sim like I said, similar to the value chain. And, you know, the supplier network of resources has significant impact on the firm's performance. So companies want to be able to have a better strategy or better understanding of their supply chain to make sure there's no disruptions because if any one piece of the supply chain breaks your company's not going to be selling their products so they have to have a good strategic plan on the company's su supply chain uh, to make sure that it's durable there's con contingencies in place in case something uh, part of it breaks they have an alternative to go to okay so that's about an hour. We've talked about uh, internal scanning and organizational analysis. A very important chapter. Uh, now, next chapter, we're going to move into chapter six, which really starts our strategy formulation uh, set of chapters and becomes, uh, I think the class will be a little bit more interesting when we move into these chapters. We're going to actually start talking about strategy, situation analysis, and business strategy directly. Okay, so I'll see you then. Take care.